Well, I have to reveal something, America. Many of you are not going to like this. But yesterday at a private ceremony, just three people attending, me, myself, and I, we have very strict rules at Fatties United. We give honorary membership or just straight out membership based on people who are fat. Now, I'm not fat. I would say I'm a little husky. But nonetheless, I appointed myself the executive director, CEO, founder, and chairman of Fatties United, or FU. And as we look around the globe, we look around the country to add additional members. Well, yesterday we saw one, Mr. Producer. Chairman Xi of Communist China. Looks to be about 40 pounds overweight, by my estimation. It's a fat guy. And uh, so now Xi, Chris Christie, who else, Mr. Producer? I can't remember everybody. We have a whole number of people. Bill Barr, I believe. I think we're going to have Randy Weingarten added as a uh, as an honorary member, but I don't want to I don't want to excite too many of you too quickly. So Xi is now an honorary member of FU or Fatties United. Uh, he's our first, I must confess, international member. He's our first communist member. But FU, I think he's deserving of FU, don't you, Mister Producer? So I wanted to make that announcement up front, F U and G go together perfectly. You know, I try to bring to you these great pieces I I come across as I do my research or somehow get over the transom. And um, I found a particularly poignant one. In the new criterion. And um, let's see here. It's on academic anti Semitism, tenured barbarians. You really need to hear this out. It's been many years, they write, since we have had occasion to mention Rashid Khalidi. Does that sound familiar to you folks? Khalidi? Enthusiast. For the Palestinian cause, bosom buddy of Barack Obama, and the Edward Sayed Professor of Modern Arab Studies at Columbia University in this space. Back in June 2005, in a column called Faculty Follies, we quoted Khalidi's thundering dismissal of what he called, quote, the utterly spurious assumption that universities are strongholds of radical and liberal beliefs, unquote. As if to underscore the malign fatuousness of that declaration. The infamous Professor Khalidi has just put his name to an open letter, signed by more than a hundred of his Columbia colleagues, calling on the university to defend those students who publicly support Hamas. And by the way, Khalidi, one of Barack Milhouse, Obama's closest friends and associates as he was starting his political career, Buddies. Remember the L.A. Times has a tape of Obama speaking to Khalidi and others? And they still haven't released it. In any way, they don't need to release it. We know of the association. Calling on the university to defend those students who publicly support Hamas. The terrorist organization that controls the Gaza Strip and that, without warning, slaughtered more than 1,200 people, mostly civilians in southern Israel, on October 7. Now, that massacre also left 5,000 injured and saw more than 200 people, including infants, toddlers, and the elderly kidnapped and dragged back to Gaza Strip, killed more Jews than any event since the Holocaust, as you know. Khalidi, 
Khalidi and his colleagues are incensed that the names and likeness of some of these pro-Palestinian student protesters, that is, pro-Hamas student protesters, have been posted under the rubric, quote, Columbia's leading anti-Semites, unquote. So these professors write in their letter, as scholars, they write without irony, who are committed to robust inquiry about the most challenging matters of our time, we feel compelled to respond to those who label our students anti-Semitic if they express empathy for the lives and dignity of Palestinians and or if they signed onto a student written statement that situated the military action begun on October 7th within the larger context of the occupation of Palestine by Israel. Nobody was occupying the Gaza Strip. Israelis gave it to the Palestinians. But facts are funny things. And so they write, where does one start? We're tempted to begin with the question of whether anyone anywhere has objected to people expressing empathy for the lives and dignities and dignity of Palestinians. But let's leave that trope, along with the needling as scholars gambit, to one side for a moment and concentrate on two phrases. Military action begun on October 7th and the larger context of the occupation of Palestine by Israel. In the modern world, a military action is understood to be an action undertaken to achieve a specific military objective. And employing only those means that are in accordance with the recognized rules of combat. High up on the list of those rules is concern for non-combatants. It's an unfortunate fact that civilians are often killed in military action, but they must not be explicitly targeted. Nor may, may they be deliberately mistreated. <clears throat> You know, like decapitating them, raping them and shooting them in the back of the head, dismembering them, sticking them in ovens, you know, stuff like that. In this sense, what Hamas started on October 7 was not a military action. It was a slaughter undertaken to foment terror. Civilians were not collateral victims of the operation. They, they were deliberately targeted for rape, torture, kidnapping and murder. The vast majority of the victims were civilians, not military personnel. It's also worth noting the video evidence that in some instances, so-called civilian Gazans seem to have participated in the atrocities. And that's a fact that I have been meaning to mention. Contrast the behavior of Hamas with the behavior of the Israeli Defense Forces responding to the massacre. For weeks after the attack, the IDF urged civilians to evacuate to the south of Gaza, away from the headquarters of Hamas, which was certain to be the center of Israel's operations. Close to a million Gazans did evacuate. More tried to do so, but were prevented by Hamas, which confiscated their car keys and gasoline and destroyed humanitarian corridors that Israel had constructed to aid evacuation. And by the way, they also killed people who were trying to leave. Hamas, in direct flouting of the Geneva Conventions. And by the way, the reason they're terrorists is because they don't care about the rules of war, Geneva Conventions, the death of citizens, hence they're terrorists has always used civilians as human shields. And in this instance, the more than 200 hostages it took from Israel, part of that shield, who knows where they might be secreted. As I said the other day, my great fear is that many of them have been executed. And they found a woman, 65-year-old Israeli, Ms. Weiss, been taken hostage. They found her on the side of the street. She'd been murdered. But by far the largest component of human bargaining chips have been ordinary Gazans. Hamas, again in violation of the Geneva Conventions, places military assets and command centers within adjacent to and underneath schools, mosques, hospitals, and residential buildings. Not only does this ensure collateral damage to life and property, it also transforms those non-military sites into military targets. It is further worth noting that not only does Hamas exaggerate the extent of its civilian casualties, it also, as many video clips have confirmed, displays fake deaths and injuries. The corpses they have here, quote-unquote, that suddenly arise and walk are their gruesomely injured actor who is later seen cavorting on the street. Make for inadvertently amusing viewing, writes the new Criterion. The same perfidy is true of Hamas's cynical exploitation of sacrosanct symbols of protected assets. 
ambulances have large red crosses painted on them to signal their exemption from assault. But the exemption is in force only so long as the vehicles are used for the purpose for which they were intended, the transportation of the sick and wounded. The IDF has presented video footage of Hamas operatives using ambulances essentially as taxes to get around the city with impunity. That has the effect of making all ambulances suspect and thus vulnerable and transforming ones that are identified as transporting military personnel into targets. And it goes on. Before leaving the phrase about military action, it's worth noting that Khalidi, Professor Khalidi, Barack Obama's buddy, and his colleagues write that the action by Hamas has only begun, quote unquote. That implies that it's ongoing. As we write, the Israelis have made rapid progress against Hamas. The quick inroads made by the IDF have led to loud demands from the White House to the streets of London and many other places beside for, quote-unquote, a humanitarian pause, a ceasefire. But no such suspension should be contemplated against an enemy. It's begun, but not completed, its hostile actions. It's a surreal demand, a so-called humanitarian pause requested by an entity that just weeks ago undertook an ostentatiously anti-humanitarian rampage of such murderous ferocity and savageness. But let us now turn to the larger context of the occupation of Palestine by Israel, the phrase used in the letter by these professors, of which Khalidi and his colleagues speak. Pace the prevailing narrative, there is no occupation of Palestine by Israel. Really, to understand the political situation in that part of the world, one would have to go back to at least 1917, if not indeed to ancient times. But in 1917, the Balfour Declaration, contemplating the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire, explicitly sought to create, quote, a national home for the Jewish people, unquote. And by the way, they are the indigenous people, but they're talking about at that time in modern times. Explicitly sought to create a national home for the Jewish people, which became an international commitment with the League of Nations, formally adopted in 1922. The goal was eventually accomplished in 1948 when the state of Israel was created, having been strengthened by a 1947 resolution adopted by two-thirds vote of the United Nations General Assembly. Can you imagine that happening today? The succeeding history is complex. Its chief feature has two aspects. One is the story of attack after attack by Arabs against Israel, beginning just hours after the nation was born. The other is the series of compromises, negotiations, and concessions by Israel, whose overriding desire has been peaceful coexistence. The present instance, the relevant drama began in 2005 when Israel withdrew all of its citizens, all of their settlements, military outposts from the Gaza Strip. The following year, Hamas won power in a legislative election, the last such election in Gaza, expelled other Palestinian groups, and has ruled the area as a theocratic war party ever since. Some pro-Palestinian commentators say the Gaza Strip is a prison state. If so, as one observer put it, Hamas is the warden. Hamas is the warden. And so uh, it goes on, and I I wanted to read this to you, not only because it's correct, but... This tie-in with Khalidi and his tie-in with Obama, Obama's statement in recent times. Absolutely disgusting and appalling. 